This course on Introduction to Mechanical Ventilation is for beginners. The principles and applications of mechanical ventilation is very complex and it's easy to get overwhelmed with all the information that's going to be coming at you from your lecture class and uh, in your lab. I want to make it clear here that this is not part of your lecture class and this is not part of your lab. This is simply uh, me going over some of the things that you will learn in the lab and in your lecture class and perhaps giving it to you at a little different angle to help you to uh, have a, a, a better understanding of some of these concepts. You think uh, mechanical ventilation can't be too hard. Air inside the ventilator goes through some tubes into the patient and then the patient exhales through the tubes back into the ventilator. Air goes in, air comes out. How hard can it be? Well, there, you're about to find out. You're going to have a whole year of lecture and uh, labs on mechanical ventilation as well as all that you're going to learn in clinical. It's an uh, enormous body of knowledge that you're about to start learning about. And I want to help you to get through this without a whole lot of uh, <clears throat> distress and uh, thinking that you're just not getting it. So, to begin, let's first talk about um, indications. Of course, on you know any uh, medical procedure or medication, uh, should begin <coughs> with the indications and perhaps contraindications of uh, what the subject matter is going to be about. So, when is it indicated that we uh, intubate a patient and put him on a ventilator and provide mechanical ventilatory support? Well, the short answer is, well, it's when they can't breathe or they can't breathe adequately. And, um, but it, it's a little more detailed than that. But um, I'm just going to go over a few things here. Your textbook may uh, say these things in a little different way or adds uh, or subtract from it. But basically, we're going to have to uh, intubate and provide mechanical ventilatory support for a patient who's going uh, into surgery. <clears throat> patient goes into the operating room and the anesthesiologist gives them some drugs to knock them out completely. They're going to be paralyzed. They're not going to be able to breathe. And so the anesthesiologist is going to breathe for them with his anesthesia machine, which is also a ventilator. Uh, the, the reason why they have to uh, paralyze these patients is that during the, some delicate surgeries, uh, they can't have the patient twitching or moving around or trying to roll over or anything like that. So they got to have the patient perfectly still. So since he's going to be paralyzed, he's not going to be able to breathe. So the machine is going to breathe for him. Now, the anesthesiologist <clears throat> is not so much concerned with how big a tidal volume he's giving the patient or even the respiratory rate, the anesthesiologist is mostly going by the pulse oximeter and capnography. He's going to be looking at the patient's end tidal CO2 <clears throat> and adjusting the ventilator so that uh, those are all uh, in acceptable ranges. Another reason we would want to put a patient on the uh, ventilator is uh, if he's apneic. Of course, that would also be the per surgical patient who just was paralyzed. Uh, he's going to be apneic. But other causes of apnea might be like a patient has um, had a, a serious motor vehicle accident, a serious head injury, and his respiratory center is affected and he has no drive to breathe. It could be patients who are, have overdosed on drugs, especially depressant drugs, uh, the opioids, um, uh, which knocks out your drive to breathe. It has an effect on your uh, respiratory center. And maybe you had a patient who had a uh, heart attack and you coded them and you get the heart going again, but they're not breathing. Uh, lots of reasons why they might have apnea. It could be a patient who needs a ventilator at night because he has a problem with a, a sleep disorder that results in, in apnea. <clears throat> Another reason we might intubate our patient and put him on a ventilator is to protect his airway. Uh, sometimes patients have uh, develop, have a stroke or um, uh, some reason why they, uh, they're elderly and um, begin to aspirate their food and their liquids and things like that. And um, 
they need their airway protected. Now, those patients will probably not get, get intubated with an endotracheal tube, but have a tracheostomy tube. The patient may just be overwhelmed with thick secretions that he can't cough up, and we put in an endotracheal tube so we can suction all that out and maintain him with a ventilator until <coughs> his secretions get back to normal. I once had a, a patient come in where I was working as a respiratory therapist, and uh, the patient had been, uh, he was a victim of a gunshot wound, and he had one bullet went through him, and it went through, right through his neck. And inside the neck, you know, it's a pretty small area in there, but there's a lot of vital structures. Uh, there are blood vessels, uh, arteries and veins, carotids uh, in, inside the neck. There are also uh, the larynx and the trachea. And in addition to that, there's the spinal cord which takes up a lot of the space. But somehow this bullet had passed through this guy's neck and didn't hit any of those structures. He was in the, in the uh, emergency department uh, talking and wasn't in any respiratory distress. He was breathing fine. But the, the emergency room doctor immediately intubated this guy. And that was a smart thing to do because what he knew was going to happen was that this guy's airway was going to be closed off completely as the swelling from the, the injury from the bullet passing through his neck. And it was a good thing he did because sure enough, uh, it wasn't very long and this patient's neck uh, was bigger around than his head and uh, <clears throat> his airway would have been completely closed off and he wouldn't have been able to breathe. In addition to that, another problem would be that if the the airway got so uh, closed off by all the swelling around it, it would probably be very difficult to intubate this patient. So anyway, those are some reasons why we might want to protect the airway, and that is another indication for uh, mechanical ventilation. Uh, the <clears throat> probably most common patient that you will be uh, working with on a ventilator um, is a patient who has acute respiratory failure. Uh, when we talk about uh, organ failure of any organ, you know, if the liver fails, the kidneys fail, that means that those organs are unable to do their job. They're failing. So what is the job of the respiratory system? Well, pretty much to um, get oxygen in and get CO2 out. So if uh, either one of those two problems exist and the organ is failing, then we may want to put in an endotracheal tube and uh, provide mechanical ventilatory support. So let's go to <coughs> uh, where this patient might get intubated. Uh, you know, sometimes they get intubated in the field. Uh, the uh, paramedics uh, intubate people at the scene of a motor vehicle accident. Um, <coughs> the um, the Paramedic may intubate the patient and, and, and they bag the patient en route to the hospital. Uh, they may have a transport ventilator, a little smaller ventilator that's portable that can uh, go in the back of the ambulance with the patient and ventilate him with their ventilator and bring him into the emergency department where we will be waiting with our critical care ventilator and um, put him on that one. The uh, <coughs> Other time out in the field, it might be uh, internal or external transports. Uh, an internal transport would be where we take the patient from the ICU down to a CT scan or x-ray or anywhere that he may have to go for a procedure. We might transport him over to the operating room. A uh, patient that comes into the emergency department and gets intubated, he will uh, perhaps go to x-ray or CT scan, uh, MRI, you know, any number of places for diagnostic tests, or straight from the ER to the operating room. Uh, external transport, you may be involved with these. Um, <coughs> uh, when, that's when a patient goes from one hospital to another mostly, uh, or from the hospital to a uh, subacute care facility. Uh, infants that are born premature um, often are transported uh, from the hospital where they're born to a hospital where they can provide a higher level of care.
So we have a lot of neonatal transports like that. So the patient uh, on a ventilator could be out in the field at the side of the highway or the uh, scene of a, uh, a problem where a patient needed had a heart attack at home and the paramedic intubate and provide mechanical ventilatory support. <clears throat> More often, uh, you're going to see the patient get intubated once he gets to the ED. Uh, you may be assigned to work in the emergency department and you're going to get called down there every time a patient comes in who uh, is intubated or if the patient is coming in that might need to get intubated. So in the emergency department, you will have uh, your ventilator set up, ready to go. The patient comes in, the uh, ER doc makes a decision to uh, intubate or not to intubate or to watch or just maybe do a blood gas and see what it looks like. Uh, but you're going to see a lot of people get intubated in the emergency department. <clears throat> And it could be in the operating room, as we talked about before, the patient's going to get surgery. The anesthesiologist intubates people all day long in the operating room. And um, they, they knock the patient out, they intubate him, and after the surgery, the surgeons zip him up, and then um, uh, the anesthesiologist is going to reverse all these drugs that have been keeping the patient down. And when the patient opens his eyes and uh, looks like he can breathe, and they let him, let, he'll let the patient breathe spontaneously a little bit, make sure he's uh, awake enough and alert enough and um, uh, off the drugs enough to, to be able to breathe, and he will take the tube out. So most of these patients that go in the operating room don't remember being intubated, and they don't remember being extubated. Uh, sometimes the patients just don't wake up from the surgery like uh, they're expected to, and they may uh, not be able to take this guy off the ventilator. Um, so he, he could uh, go into the recovery room uh, on a ventilator, and then the respiratory therapist will be taking care of that ventilator in the, uh, in the recovery room or the uh, post-anesthesia care unit, the PACU, as it's often called. The patient may have got, had some extensive surgery and is going to go into the ICU, not be extubated because he's still too sick. Or uh, a lot of these uh, trauma patients are going to um, have multiple surgeries and they're in and out of the operating room and they just leave them intubated. And, you know, it may be that he's had serious head injuries or other problems and he just isn't breathing. Um, <clears throat> so those are kind of your trauma patients and your post-op patients. You uh, are going to have most of your patients on ventilators in the intensive care unit. In fact, it's interesting, um, there was no such a thing as an intensive care unit until there were ventilators. Ventilators kind of invented the intensive care unit. They needed to put the people that were this sick and they need this kind of care and expertise. Uh, so they, they built ICUs. So the ICU would not exist if it weren't for ventilators. Um, Patients in the ICU uh, may not be on a ventilator, but they're really, really sick. Uh, some of the patients in the ICU are going to get intubated after they've been there for a little while, and some of the patients in the ICU uh, will just get their treatment and be out. But usually, once a patient in the ICU has been extubated, taken off the ventilator, he's not there usually more, uh, even 24 hours, and they ship him out to one of the floors. So the ICU uh, is going to be where the majority of your ventilators are. You may have a 12-bed a, a ICU, and one day you have two of those beds are, are ventilator patients. And another day you come in, and all 12 beds are filled up with ventilator patients. You might have eight or six. It really varies a lot uh, from day to day, shift to shift uh, in the ICU, how many ventilators you will have. Um, but most, most ICUs are going to always have at least one or two ventilators going at all times. It's kind of unusual for the ICU at most hospitals to have no ventilators. So that's where you're going to be taking care of the patients on the ventilator. Uh, also, you're going to have the, a ventilator on a patient just about anywhere in the hospital. Uh, you have patients that code in the um, CT scanner or an x-ray or doing some procedure anywhere in the hospital, and you may get, be, have to go there and, and uh, the doctor intubates a patient uh, wherever he is in the CT scan uh, department. Uh, 
often patients will get intubated in, in their bed in their room out on one of the floors in the hospital outside the ICU. Uh, patients uh, go bad and uh, then they, uh, they need to be intubated. Now the, the patient may be emergently transported to the ICU and intubated in the ICU, but sometimes uh, the ICU is full and they have to wait till they move a patient out, clean the room, and get it ready for another patient. So he may be parked uh, in a place that is uh, not an ICU setting. At home, patients uh, that uh, require mechanical ventilation uh, that are chronically ventilator dependent uh, may have a ventilator at home. We have a lot of pediatric patients with uh, different kinds of problems that uh, that have to be on a ventilator uh, and so the, the family takes care of the ventilator but there will be a th respiratory therapist that will uh, help set up the ventilator and teach the family how to do all of the stuff with the ventilator and will be on call 24 7. So if there's a problem the, uh, the parents or, or the caregivers will call uh, the on-call respiratory therapist and that therapist will often solve problems over the phone, but will go there or call an ambulance or different kind of things like that. Uh, so there are a lot of respiratory therapists out there and this is a, 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 a job that uh, a lot of RTs prefer over working in the hospital are home care respiratory therapists and so they will be taking care of lots of patients on ventilators um, uh, all over town and, uh, and other things that the respiratory therapist does besides ventilators but we have a lot of patients at home on ventilators uh, also patients with ALS or these uh, progressive neuromuscular diseases that are not going to get better they get to a point where they uh, need uh, a ventilator and so they will have a ventilator at home today that's mostly non-invasive ventilation you've learned I know about uh, BiPAP and what that's about is non-invasive ventilation we don't we don't use the endotracheal tube but we can ventilate the patient with a mask and um, so we have a lot of those kind of patients at home now the patient may get intubated uh, with an endotracheal tube and that's the real common way but the patient may uh, have a tracheostomy tube he may be a patient that you had that had an endotracheal tube and he was very difficult to get off the ventilator and after a week or two they decide to trach the patient <clears throat> he may have had some kind of surgery upper um, airway surgery where uh, you know facial problems and uh, intubating down the the, through the oral route is not um, <clears throat> possible and so they trach the patient. Different kind of reasons why the patient may have, have a, a tracheostomy tube but you will have patients on the ventilator with a tracheostomy tube. Uh, and of course uh, as I just mentioned with the home care patient uh, we can provide mechanical ventilatory support to a patient without uh, an, an endotracheal or tracheostomy tube we can do that with a face mask and we call this NIV non-invasive ventilation invasive ventilation means you invade the airway non-invasive ventilation means that you don't invade the airway and so that would be with a mask and uh, we call this BiPAP <coughs> we've been uh, providing mechanical ventilatory support to patients with a mask for a good 20 years now and uh, we've gotten pretty good at it and the machines have gotten to to be very um, uh, patient friendly and uh, user friendly and able to do um, more complicated things and we're learning more about it so you're going to see a lot of patients be ventilated non-invasively So let's talk a, a bit about this acute respiratory failure. This is going to be a lot of our patients, and you're going to have patients with a, uh, are intubated because of a, a lung failure of a, or airway failure, uh, failure to breathe adequately. Um, and it may be because, as I said earlier, you know, they, they, it might be because they have a problem with oxygenation or they might have a problem with uh, uh, eliminating CO2. So we have hypoxic acute respiratory failure, which means that the patient is not oxygenating. That's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, now, 
when we have a patient who um, has a PO2 of 45 and we put a nasal cannula on him at, at two or three liters a minute and um, now he's um, got an adequate oxygenation, then uh, he w doesn't need to be intubated. So it's a patient who is hypoxic and we can't treat him with just a, a oxygen by a nasal cannula or a mask. <clears throat> hypoxic acute respiratory failure is a problem at the lung parenchyma. This is lung failure. This is a problem of oxygen transporting across the alveolar capillary membrane. So generally we're talking about patients who have a shunt. Uh, they have a shunt producing disease like pneumonia or pulmonary edema. The, uh, <clears throat> the patient who is hypoxic, we have them on a, 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 a say a high flow nasal cannula or whatever and we're giving him a hundred percent oxygen and um, <clears throat> why would we intubate him because you know on the ventilator we can only give a hundred percent oxygen right well the answer is is that we can do things with our ventilator to open up these alveoli that are collapsed and ventilate um, lung units uh, better and provide oxygen down uh, deeper in the lung uh, sometimes we have to use pressure to do that and we'll talk about that as we go along here <clears throat> but hypoxic respiratory failure is not a problem of the air going in and out. It is not that the patient can't get the air in and out. Uh, usually it's, it's a problem of the, uh, at the capillary and alveoli inter interface, getting the oxygen into the blood. Hypercapnic respiratory failure, now that's CO2 failure. That's ventilatory failure. That doesn't have much to do with a uh, transport of ox uh, CO2 across the alveolar capillary membrane. Remember, CO2 diffuses 20 times faster and more easily than oxygen. So that's not the problem with the patient's hypercapnia, probably. It, it has to do with getting the air in and out <clears throat> to main, maintain a normal CO2 and pH. And when, the, when the, there's a failure to do that, uh, then we call that hypercapnic respiratory failure. So hypercapnic respiratory failure means that <clears throat> the CO2 is high. The, 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 this organ is not doing its job and the CO2 goes up. So what about a patient who has a CO2 of uh, 50, but a normal pH, like our COPD patients? Well, that's not acute respiratory failure. That's high, uh, that's chronic respiratory failure. We don't uh, intubate people for chronic respiratory failure. If we intubated people just because their CO2 was high, uh, we'd have a lot of people getting intubated, all of our COPD patients. So um, we do have a COPD patient, though, that has a normally high CO2 and a normal pH, but then he gets a COPD exacerbation, uh, develops pneumonia, or um, has some other kind of issues going on. And we call that acute on chronic respiratory failure. So we would uh, uh, likely intubate that patient who has acute on chronic respiratory failure, unless, of course, he has some advanced directive and he doesn't want to be intubated. Uh, but anyway, that's pretty much uh, respiratory failure there. The patient's failing to oxygenate. Uh, he's failing to uh, ventilate and remove CO2. And um, when you intubate this guy, however, you may see both hypoxic and hypercapnic respiratory failure. <clears throat> you know, if the CO2 is, uh, as the alveoli are filled with more and more CO2, there's less room for oxygen. So anybody that has a high CO2 will have a low O2. And uh, so let's move on to um, a little bit more about this uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure. Uh, and as I said, that's lung failure, and that's usually caused by uh, a severe VQ mismatch. Um, a, a very when anybody with a low VQ has um, is hypoxic, and so that means that there's not uh, enough ventilation. Uh, to match the perfusion uh, to the lungs. <clears throat> so if there's not much uh, ventilation to the alveoli, then there's not much oxygen transported across the alveolar capillary membrane into uh, the capillary blood. <clears throat> 
if it's a if it's not a severe VQ mismatch, usually that can be treated with a, 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 some supplemental oxygen, and the patient won't need to be intubated. But that's a patient with a severe VQ mismatch. And of course, right to left shunting. Right to left means from the right heart to the left heart, and uh, the, this blood, some of this blood, <coughs> going from the right heart to the left heart, are not picking up oxygen from the alveoli and the reason for that is almost always that uh, the alveoli are collapsed and there's no air in them or they're flooded so collapsed or flooded alveoli collapsed uh, uh, alveoli you know that is uh, atelectasis is what we call collapsed alveoli atelectasis is collapsed uh, not only alveoli but uh, the small airways the, the The problem with um, flooded alveoli, <clears throat> if the alveolus is full of fluid, then there's not going to be any air in there, and those, so those alveoli will be perfused, and they're not going to pick up any oxygen because they're, they're, the alveoli that they're perfusing are full of, full of fluid. And that would be fluid like some from pulmonary edema, pulmonary edema fluid filling up the alveoli and the, and the airways. Uh, and that could be um, from uh, pneumonia, and the alveoli are filled with pus. Anyway, <clears throat> you have shunting when you have no ventilation, but you have perfusion, and that's generally collapsed or flooded alveoli. Uh, now, the collapsed alveoli, uh, um, as I said, that's atelectasis, but usually when a patient needs to be intubated because of this severe atelectasis, it's due to a condition we call ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. I'm sure you've heard about that. But what happens in ARDS is uh, the lung loses surfactant. The surfactant becomes dysfunctional in a large uh, percentage of the lung. Two-thirds to three-fourths of the lung can be collapsed uh, with ARDS. Uh, so that's a pretty severe shunting, and we have to put that patient on the ventilator. And alveolar hypoventilation, as I said, you know, the, uh, this, the higher the CO2 in the alveoli, the lower the O2. <clears throat> and another thing that's not listed here is uh, air, airway obstruction. If you have an airway obstruction, there's no uh, oxygen getting to the alveoli distal to that uh, obstruction. So uh, let's say we have this patient, he's very, very hypoxic, and we need to put him on a ventilator. He's not oxygenating well on 100%. We put him on the ventilator, we, didn't, we can only give him 100%, right? Uh, but, so what can we do with the ventilator uh, <coughs> to uh, improve his oxygenation? And the answer is uh, we can use the pressures from the ventilator to open up alveoli to get air in an, an oxygen into the alveoli that um, are having a hard time uh, uh, being uh, opened and uh, provided uh, fresh oxygen. And the pressure that we use to do that is not so much the inspiratory pressure, but the expiratory pressure. Normally, you, the patient would breathe in and exhale, and the pressure would go back down to pretty much zero. We call zero. It's actually ambient pressure. Uh, <clears throat> but with this patient, like the patient with ARDS who has these collapsed alveoli, no alve no, uh, uh, not enough surfactant, uh, the patient exhales and the lungs collapse. These alveoli all collapse. So the ventilator gives another breath and that causes a lot of these alveoli to open up again. But when the patient exhales, they collapse. So we set the uh, expiratory pressure up to 5, 10, 15, 20 centimeters of water pressure and to keep those alveoli from collapsing on exhalation. And that pressure is the expiratory pressure. We call that PEEP positive expiratory pressure. And uh, another uh, variation of that is CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, where the pressure is positive on exhalation, uh, uh, primarily to prevent uh, recollapse of those alveoli. So uh, just to recap here, the uh, uh, hypoxic respiratory failure is usually due to collapsed or flooded alveoli, pneumonia, pulmonary edema.
those are the, the biggies that are going to cause uh, the patient to be at, in hypoxemic respiratory failure. If we can provide the patient with a uh, some oxygen and he's not high doesn't have hypoxemia anymore then we probably wouldn't intubate but if it's severe and uh, we used to have some guidelines on that but we now we have high flow nasal cannula and other things that we're doing they those old definitions don't really fit too well but pretty much if a patient requires uh, more than 50 percent oxygen to adequately oxygenate he's got a pretty severe problem uh, you know, if his PO2 is less than 60 and he's breathing 50% oxygen, that's a serious problem because his PO2 on 50% oxygen should be like 200 or so, you know, up in that range. So uh, that's a hypoxemic respiratory failure. The other type of respiratory failure, as I talked about, is the hypercapnic respiratory failure. <clears throat> and that has to do with CO2. That has to do with ventilation. Remember, ventilation is the air going in and out. And uh, so we can call it hypercapnic respiratory failure. We can call it uh, uh, um, respiratory acidosis, uh, ventilatory failure. Uh, a couple of different ways we can describe that uh, alveolar hypoventilation. I think a good term, a good way to, to, to have a good picture of what this is about is to think of it as ventilatory pump failure. Uh, you know, we, we don't have any problem thinking of the heart as a pump. It clearly is a pump. The heart pumps the blood around. It provides the circulation and it pumps. Well, air is pumped in and out of the lungs. So it's a, the ventilatory pump is the respiratory muscles, primarily the diaphragm, but all the accessory muscles. Um, <clears throat> and so the ventilatory pump can fail for, you know, a lot of reasons. And we're going to talk about that on our, our next slide here, which uh, we will go to. Oh, well, first of all, uh, it's an inability to maintain uh, a normal PaCO2. So uh, your textbooks um, often will say if the CO2 is above 50. Well, you know, if your CO2 should be 40. <clears throat> if your CO2 goes up above 40, uh, your respiratory center just tell, tells you to breathe more and it brings it back down to, uh, to 40 again to uh, pH of 740. So anytime the CO2 is high, uh, that is uh, indicates there is a problem. Your textbook says 50, and that's uh, okay to think of that, but mostly what we want to uh, see to, to tell us we need to intubate this patient is, is that CO2 rising? So we're looking at the trend. Is the CO2 high and it's going up? That's where we get really worried and we would uh, uh, probably want to provide mechanical ventilatory support for that patient either with an endotracheal tube or with a mask and provide non-invasive ventilation. So let's uh, talk about some of these causes of this. <clears throat> um, and it's pretty much one of these three things is the problem why this va the ventilatory pump is failing to do its job, which is to make the CO2 40 and the pH 740. It could be a problem with the central nervous system. A uh, patient who's uh, had a motor vehicle accident and serious head injury, uh, he, his respiratory center may be impaired. And so there is no message saying, telling uh, uh, the, the nerves and muscles to do their job and uh, uh, pump air in and out. Uh, it could be uh, lesions in the brain, you know, some different kinds of uh, tumors in the brain uh, or injuries or abscesses or, you know, any number of things that can happen. Uh, but the problem with the ventilatory pump failing could be uh, related to the respiratory center. It's somehow impaired. Uh, a common one here is um, drugs, especially these uh, depressant drugs, these opioids. Uh, that cause uh, a depression in the drive to breathe. And so the CO2 goes up and that's a uh, ventilatory pump failure caused by uh, the central nervous system. Uh, it could be neuromuscular function. You know, we have these diseases like Guillain-Barre and myasthenia gravis, these progressive um, uh, diseases that 
<clears throat> can wind up with total paralysis or some variation, some wear in between. And uh, patients with ALS and muscular dystrophy, all those kind of things, uh, the central, the, the respiratory center is intact, but the message is not getting down to this, uh, uh, through the nerves to uh, cause the muscle to contract. Uh, the CO2 could be high because the pump is failing because the pump just can't do the work caused by a breathing problem that is pretty much a problem with the resistance of air flowing through the airways or the ability to distend the lung. The lung becomes very difficult to distend. So if the airway resistance is high, uh, such as a, a, a narrowing of the airways, like a patient with uh, asthma or COPD with uh, bronchoconstriction and uh, airway inflammation and uh, secretions in the airways, all of these things uh, are going to increase the airway resistance and, and make the work of breathing harder. Now, the respiratory muscle is a very thin muscle and can fatigue pretty easily. So if these things are very severe, the patient may be able to maintain a normal CO2 for a while, but when, when uh, his respiratory muscles begin to fatigue, the CO2 goes up and will continue to go up. So um, <clears throat> another problem <clears throat> is with uh, lung elastance. The lung becomes more elastic at one it there's a greater force to try to make it exhale so that makes it harder for the lung, lung to be inflated and when we when we talk about this um, part of uh, respiratory mechanics uh, we respiratory therapists uh, look at it in terms of the compliance of lung how easy is the lung to distend so we've got two problems here that it could be uh, one is uh, a problem with airflow and that is a problem with patients who have obstructive diseases. Their obstructive diseases means there's obstruction of airflow through the airways. Uh, the inability to distend the lung adequately or to be able to do it without uh, breathing at a fatiguing workload, those are restrictive diseases. So obstructive diseases obstruct airflow, restrictive diseases restrict inspiration. Re they restrict the uh, inflation of the lung the distension of the lung. So a patient has a, a problem with um, this uh, increase in the work of breathing. It's usually caused by those two things. Now, another thing that can cause an increase in the work of breathing is if a patient is trying to breathe a big minute ventilation. You know, the, uh, the patient with a diabetic ketoacidosis uh, is going to try to compensate for that as metabolic acidosis by breathing more and they could be breathing um, uh, a, a large amount of air per minute and that increases their work of breathing. Um, it, it could be any other kind of uh, a metabolic acidosis but uh, whatever would cause the patient to have to uh, uh, double up on the, his minute ventilation, he's doubling up on the work to, to do that. And especially if a patient who is already impaired, uh, that can just put, put him over the edge. So those are the reasons why the ventilatory pump may fail. I'll go into a little more about each one of these things, uh, kind of recap what I just said, <coughs> depressant drugs. And as I said, you know, that could be these opioids, a uh, patient come in the emergency room overdosed on uh, some drug and not breathing or not breathing adequately. Uh, but th that can also happen in the hospital. The nurse gives uh, some little old lady some uh, morphine that the doctor ordered, and uh, this uh, she it's too much. Or it could wouldn't have to be a little old lady. It could be uh, anybody uh, getting uh, these uh, type of drugs that are respiratory depressants in the hospital, and they can um, uh, st start to breathe very shallowly or stop breathing altogether. Uh, now, if it's opioids, of course, we have drugs. A doctor come in, and we have a rapid response. Everybody comes in the room, and uh, the, they're maybe bagging the patient, and um, they discover that the patient had just gotten a, 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 some morphine or whatever, and they suspect that we have a drug called Narcan, and we can reverse that real quickly. Uh, but sometimes uh, they, they, uh, the drugs are... Uh, 
in the type of drugs that uh, the Narcan isn't going to work against. So we may need to get intubated. <coughs> Uh, as I said, brain or brainstem lesions, uh, sleep apnea syndrome, patients with ha have central apnea uh, when they sleep, uh, may need to have a ventilator at night, and often that will just be a, um, a non-invasive ventilation, uh, but sometimes these patients need to be trached. Uh, that's not to say uh, that's not so much obstructive sleep apnea, uh, that uh, would not cause us to intubate the patient. He would just have to have some CPAP while he sleeps at night. Uh, sometimes we have COPD patients who have in-stage <coughs> uh, 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 CO2. I mean, we're talking only about 1% or 2% of all COPD patients uh, who have such high CO2s that if we give them too much oxygen, they tend to want to quit breathing. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later. And you may have, the patient may have, uh, as I talked about, have a, a, a increased dive to, drive to breathe because he has some metabolic acidosis. Uh, some patients, when they get dyspneic and it's hard to breathe, they panic and they have a lot of anxiety. And uh, that really increases their metabolic rate and causes them to have to breathe a big minute ventilation, which can, uh, if it goes on long enough, can cause respiratory muscle fatigue. And when the respiratory muscles fatigue, you know, a late sign of respiratory muscle fatigue is the CO2 going up. Uh, here's some of the, the disorders that are ca caused by neuromuscular function. You know, you have these paralytic disorders like the myasthenia gravis, Guillain-Barre. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, you'll see a fair amount of these patients with myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barre. They don't always need to be intubated just because they have those, but we, because some patients, the uh, the per, the paralysis or weakness uh, may not uh, go to the point where they need to be intubated, and other patients can be just totally paralyzed with either one of those problems, and we'll have to provide me mechanical ventilatory support. Uh, when these patients come in the hospital, you will probably be uh, you have a doctor's order to check their negative inspiratory force and their vital capacity like every four hours. Uh, when the, the inspiratory force goes below 20, the maximal pressure they can generate on a, with an inspiration, when it falls below 20, that means the patient doesn't have any reserve. It also means that he won't be able to protect his airway and those guys will have to be intubated. And we intubate them and they're intubated until they uh, are able to uh, use their respiratory muscles to uh, breathe adequately again. And then we have these paralytic problems like tetanus and botulism uh, that, um, you know, botulism poisoning, it, it causes a paralysis and the patient can't breathe and you have to be on the ventilator. And polio, we don't see too much of that anymore, uh, you know, but um, MS, ALS, muscular dystrophy, uh, those kind of problems, uh, they're not going to come in the hospital and we're going to turn them around. They're going to get better and go home. These, these, uh, uh, these diseases, they progressively get weaker and weaker and weaker. And uh, we have a lot of ALS patients out there at home that are being ventilated <coughs> with um, um, non-invasive ventilation. Uh, in the recent past, a patient with ALS would um, get progressively weaker and weaker until he could not breathe adequately. And then he, there was the, a choice that the patient would have. He's either going to die or he could get a tracheostomy. And so uh, often they would uh, decide on having a tracheostomy. Uh, but the problem is, is with the tracheostomy and their hypoventilation and uh, they tend to uh, get pneumonias easily <coughs> and um, they would live, uh, a lot of them would only live about another six months. Uh, but now with non-invasive ventilation, we got real sophisticated machines and we know how to do it and we have different interfaces for these patients and uh, they are living like seven years longer, not six months. Uh, so this is, uh, again, these patients are at home, they, they have chronic diseases, they come in the hospital, they're probably not going to go to the ICU, although you might see some. Uh, but those are uh, patients who are having uh, 
ventilatory pump failure. The pump is, is failing. And of course, there's different kind of drugs that can affect neuromuscular transmission. And uh, there can be problems with impaired muscle function, the diaphragm primarily. Uh, uh, lots of different things can, can cause that. You could have uh, phrenic nerve damage. You could have a, a patient in a, a motor vehicle accident that has, his uh, diaphragm has taken a hit or his accessory muscles. Uh, uh, and other kind of diseases that can result in that. And I talked about the, uh, the increase in the work of breathing and talk about compliance, right? So when we talk about the compliance, we're not just talking about the compliance of the lung, but also the compliance of the chest wall surrounding the lung. If the chest wall it doesn't uh, distend easily, then the lungs aren't going to distend easily and they may not be able to get a, enough air in. Uh, so plural occupying lesions, that would be like your um, uh, pleural effusions. And uh, in, anything is, uh, you know, whether it's an empyema, whether it's a infectious material or serious fluid in, in the pleural space, uh, it restricts inspiration. <clears throat> Chest wall deformities, pe people with um, uh, kyphoscoliosis, uh, you can see how that would uh, uh, make the chest wall compliance be uh, low and increase the work of breathing. <clears throat> and then there's the uh, airway resistance problems, the obstructive diseases um, such as bronchoconstriction, airway inflammation, and secretions in the airways. Uh, lung tissue involvement, you know, you can have patients with uh, fibrosis. A fibrotic lung is stiff, it's, you know, fibrosis is scarring, and uh, so they uh, have to work harder to distend the lung to get a breath. And uh, pulmonary vascular problems, uh, they could have uh, being congestive heart failure, you could have problems with uh, uh, a condition that uh, you'll see called uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension or uh, primary pulmonary hypertension or pulmonary hypertension for just about any any reason uh, and this term dynamic hyperinflation that's something that happens with our COPD and asthma patients they uh, <clears throat> they don't exhale very well they may get the air in okay but when they try to exhale, it just doesn't come out fast enough, and they have to try to push the air out. And uh, pretty, if the if it takes too long for them to exhale that air, uh, they're going to try to they're going to want to breathe in. So they breathe in before they finished exhaling, and so they uh, wind up with um, lungs that are hyperinflated. And if the lungs are too full of air, how can you take a, a normal-sized breath on top of that? That makes it difficult. It increases your work of breathing when you have this dynamic hyperinflation. Uh, uh, when the patient's on the ventilator and we have dynamic hyperinflation, uh, that is what we call auto peep. It's a peep. It's a positive pressure in the chest uh, that is not uh, what we do intentionally with our machine to provide peep. Anyway, there'll be a lot more about that uh, later. So what we want to remember uh, this term here, respiratory muscle fatigue. We need to, uh, to have a good understanding of respiratory muscle fatigue. The patient is going to have respiratory muscle fatigue if his work of breathing is too high for any of those reasons we just talked about. And so we need to look for signs of respiratory muscle fatigue in our patient and understand uh, how that happens. Uh, 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 one of the main signs you will see when a patient's uh, respiratory muscles are beginning to fatigue is the respiratory pattern, and it would be rapid, shallow breathing. They, uh, their muscles are fatigued. They can't afford to take a normal sized breath, so they take little breaths and they breathe fast. Uh, so it's always a bad sign when we see a patient uh, who uh, is, uh, has that breathing pattern, rapid, shallow breathing. It's very often uh, respiratory muscle fatigue. Um, so we might be able to do something non-invasively to unload the respiratory muscles like with our BiPAP machine as we call it.
uh, non-invasive ventilation and, and, and help that patient. The patient uh, may need to get intubated because remember a late sign of respiratory muscle fatigue is the, LV, the uh, CO2 uh, increases pretty rapidly. <clears throat> now you're going to uh, be there often when patients get intubated and sometimes uh, the the doctors focus on a lot of things uh, going on with the patient and um, uh, doesn't necessarily pick up on everything but you the professional respiratory therapist need to know what it looks like when the patient is hypoxic or if he's, if he's hypercapnic if CO2 is going up. So you get called to a rapid response, you want to look for these kind of things or any patient that you get called to see or a patient that you're just routinely going to give a breathing treatment to them. Um, you know, uh, there, we have way better outcomes uh, when there is early intervention and we intubate the patient before it becomes an emergent situation. So. Um, when we have a patient who is has mild to moderate hypoxia, respiratorily he's going to be tachypneic, dyspneic, and often will uh, ex show some paleness. If he's severely uh, hypoxic, um, he he is tachypneic and di has dyspnea, complains that he's not getting enough air, it's hard to breathe, whatever and you'll see cyanosis. Now with the cyanosis, we need to remember we need to look in the back of the throat for the cyanosis. Uh, you could look at their nail beds and the nail beds are blue, but that's just because either it's cold in the room or they have poor perfusion and it may not mean uh, that, they, um, that, that that is cyanosis. Well, when you see the lips blue, when you um, have them open their mouth, you look at the back of their mouth and, and it's blue in the back of their mouth, uh, that's central cyanosis. The nail beds being blue, that's peripheral cyanosis. We don't, we're not too concerned about that. And cardiovascularly, <clears throat> this patient who is hypo has mild to moderate hypoxia uh, will have a mild hypertension. He'll be tachycardic, have peripheral vasoconstriction. Severe hypoxia, the tachycardia will eventually become bradycardia. The heart muscle will not be able to keep up with doing its work if it's not getting enough oxygen. Uh, and, the, and the patient will start to have arrhythmias and his hypertension uh, will uh, eventually lead to hypotension. So those are uh, severe hypoxia signs. And neurologically, the guy with uh, mild to moderate hypoxia may appear to be restless, disoriented, complain of headaches, uh, lassitude, which is a state or feeling of being tired and listless, weariness. Uh, so you see these kind of signs, uh, you know, your patient might be suffering from hypoxia. I've seen these signs in patients. Um, I, I can tell you a couple of instances. Uh, I, I saw a patient in in the morning, and he was, you know, chatty and talking, and you know, was very normal. And when I came back in the for his next treatment around noontime, uh, he he seemed kind of disoriented, and he was really restless. Just his hands were just kind of going here and there, and uh, um, uh, so I knew that 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 could be a sign of hypoxia. And um, so he had a nasal cannula in his nose and I looked it over to the flow meter where it was connected and it wasn't connected. It had come loose from the um, from the flow meter. And another time I saw a patient that was showing the, all these signs and um, I, I investigated and I saw uh, looked and saw his nasal cannula was laying on his pillow. It wasn't on. He had gone up, gone to the bathroom and come back and forgot to put his nasal cannula back on and he, he had gotten uh, uh, pretty uh, hypoxic. Severe hypoxia, <clears throat> they'd be real sleepy, very confused, uh, blurred tunnel vision. Uh, that's not easy to tell if they're having that, but their coordination and their judgment, uh, they're, they're slow, and uh, when you ask them a question, they're really slow to answer it, and um, that, that, that uh, could indicate uh, severe hypoxia. Also, uh, this says manic depressive activity. I don't know um, uh, if <clears throat> I would know that if I saw it. And of course, um, 
the patient becomes comatose if he's uh, hypoxic enough. So now let's look at the signs and symptoms of uh, hypercapnia. Uh, the patient, his CO2 is going up um, and mildly or moderately, uh, uh, he will again, uh, you'll see tachycardia and dyspnea. And if it's severe, the tachypnea could lead to bradypnea. You know, if your CO2, CO2 uh, can really, can actually just knock out your drive to breathe. Uh, so high CO2s uh, can cause you to, um, you would breathe le uh, less. You know, when your CO2 starts to go up, you breathe faster. Uh, but at some point, if your CO2 gets high enough, and uh, I've heard that it's somewhere around over 80, it can completely knock out your drive to breathe. Cardiovascularly, uh, tachycardia, hypertension, vasodilation, severe. You'll see tachycardia, hypertension, which will eventually become hypotension. Neurologically, headaches, drowsiness, and mild to moderate, sweating, redness of the skin. <clears throat> When I uh, get called to the emergency room or I have a patient that's in distress and I see that he's very diaphoretic, that means he's sweating a lot, he's uh, real sweaty, uh, could be that his CO2 is going up. So uh, there's a lot of other things that can cause that. Uh, people sweat for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but when a patient is having difficulty breathing and he's real sweaty, I'm going to want to get a blood gas. I want to see what that CO2 is doing because um, it could be very, very high. So you see sweating, redness of the skin. Uh, with severe, they're going to have hallucinations, uh, hypomania, which I'm not sure uh, if I would recognize that. Uh, he can have convulsions and coma. So what we want to do is when we see this patient, and you know, we're always looking at, uh, for acute respiratory failure that may need uh, intubation and mechanical ventilatory support. And as I said before, it's really critical that we um, get this patient intubated and on a ventilator before it's a code situation, before it gets very serious. Early intervention always has better outcomes for patients than uh, responding in an emergent way. So we want to look at, evaluate his level of consciousness, you know, is he alert, does he know where he is, and, uh, you know, asking him these kinds of questions, uh, uh, skin color and appearance and texture, um, and, and of course his respiratory rate, heart rate and blood pressure and body temperature. And remember, this is very, very critical, tachycardia and tachypnea are early indicators of hypoxia. So. Whatever our patient's problem is, might be hypercapnic, might be hypoxic, maybe both. Uh, could be a lot of reasons why we're going to intubate this patient and put him on the ventilator. Well, <clears throat> we get him intubated, secure the tube, call for a stat chest film, <clears throat> and then we're going to connect him to the machine. Well, we need to set some settings on this ventilator before we connect it to the patient. You know, maybe the patient before this patient had uh, was a big patient needed big tidal volumes, and this is a little patient. So we put him on the machine and he gets his big tidal volume. That would not be good. Uh, so we're going to have a starting point. Where are we going to start when we first intubate this patient and put him on a ventilator? And what are, what kind of settings do we have to set? Of course, we, we need to set an FiO2, and on our ventilators, we can give him an FiO2 anywhere between 21 and 100%. Doesn't go above 100%, um, but uh, if he needs 35%, 60%, 90%, whatever, we can dial that in. But when we are first intubating the patient, we don't know what FiO2 he's going to need. And what you're going to see out there in, 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 in clinical, when you see patients getting intubated at, at hospitals all over everywhere, they uh, start them at 100% oxygen. Uh, and for the most part, that uh, I don't believe that's a problem. Uh, the problem is <clears throat> when you take your uh, exams to get your license uh, next year when you graduate, uh, on your licensure exam, 100% is not the correct answer always. Uh, <clears throat> on the registry exam, they want you to uh, pick an FIO2 between 50 and 100%. 
their theory for that, their reasoning for that, is that if um, if the patient is oxygenating well on 50% oxygen, you intubate him and put him on 50% oxygen. Now, that is not reality. That's not what you're going to see in clinical. And there's a lot of things like that, and I'll try to point that out to you as we go along, um, that there are some things that you're going to see in clinical that isn't exactly what it says in your textbook and isn't exactly what you need to know for taking the registry exam. But what you're going to see out there is you're going to start a patient on 100% oxygen, and there's a pulse oximeter on this patient, and his sets are 100. We can right away start turning down his FiO2, and we should. We shouldn't just leave him on 100% oxygen if he doesn't need it. <coughs> Tidal volume. Big people need big breasts. Little people need little breasts. So we need to be able to tell what tidal volume we need to give for our patient. And we're going to give him a tidal volume based on his size. And um, we're not going to base it on his actual body weight. We're going to say, well, this guy weighs 180 pounds. He needs this big a tidal volume. Um, if... if uh, Let's say if uh, if I gained 100 pounds, my lungs wouldn't be any bigger. So we're going to base our tidal volume uh, on ideal body weight, which we determine the ideal body weight by knowing their gender and their height. And I got a little graph here, and I'm going to show you how to, to calculate all that. But we do have to set the uh, we want our tidal volume uh, their patient to get an adequate tidal volume, not too big, not too little. And of course, how many times a minute is he going to get that tidal volume? So we have to set a respiratory rate on our ventilator. People breathe between 12 and 18 breaths per minute is what is considered normal. And so the appropriate uh, respiratory rate to set on your ventilator when you first intubate the patient, you're not going to know exactly what respiratory rate is going to work best for him. Uh, but if you pick something between 12 and 18, then you are following uh, the, the guidelines. Uh, that's where we should uh, start our patient, 12 to 18 breaths per minute. When you take your um, licensure exam next year, uh, you need to remember that because you'll have situations where uh, you have a patient who gets intubated and put on a ventilator and you recommend a respiratory rate and a tidal volume uh, and a FiO2. Uh, you need to know that initially, it's going to be between 12 and 18. Now, these are multiple choice questions. So you look and say, you intubate the patient and give him a respiratory rate of 24. Well, that's the wrong answer because it's outside that 12 to 18. Uh, once we get the patient intubated, we may adjust some of these things here, but we got to have some place to start. <coughs> the other thing we have to determine what we're going to do with our ventilator, set on our ventilator for the patient, is the mode of ventilation. And that's the most confusing part of mechanical ventilation to people who are learning mechanical ventilation. Um, it's If you believe the ventilator manufacturers, there's about 30 different modes of ventilation. But most of these modes are the same old mode uh, that you already had. Uh, it was called something else. They just came up with a new acronym. Anyway, that's that's going to come later. We're going to go into great detail on, them, on modes of ventilation. Uh, as we proceed with this uh, presentation. So the FiO2, we're going to give him uh, probably 100% and watch our pulse oximeter and start turning that down. Uh, it, too often I've seen patients get intubated in the emergency department, put on 100%, and hours later they're still on 100% when they don't need anywhere near 100% because there's problems with uh, high concentrations of oxygen. One is, uh, you've learned about, pulmonary oxygen toxicity. <clears throat> you know, oxygen is very toxic stuff. And uh, we don't really know, uh, and it seems to vary from patient to patient and animal to animal, how much uh, oxygen is harmful. Uh, and, and we know 100% is harmful. Uh, we know that 80% is harmful, but not as harmful as fast as 100%. Um, so it's not just the concentration, but the duration. So it's recommended that we don't have anybody on 100% oxygen longer than 24 hours. Um, 
what happens with the <coughs> oxygen toxicity, pulmonary oxygen toxicity, is that um, surfactant becomes deactivated. Our uh, fluid flows into the alveoli and oxygenation gets worse and pretty soon the patient is in a condition we talked about earlier, ARDS. So pulmonary oxygen toxicity is ARDS. And in fact, if a patient has ARDS, uh, high concentrations of oxygen advance the ARDS and they get worse and they have worse outcomes. So that's um, not really a problem with our patient that we just intubate. <clears throat> He's on the ventilator uh, on 100%. He gets intubated in the um, emergency department and he sits there for a while and then they take him over to uh, x-ray and he sees an x-ray for an hour or so <clears throat> then he comes back to the emergency department and they wait for him to have a bed and he goes up <clears throat> that's not going to be a problem with pulmonary oxygen toxicity what could be a problem in the short term is absorption atelectasis and I'm pretty sure you learned about absorption atelectasis. When air gets trapped in, uh, in, in some alveoli and the airways are obstructed, the patient has a lot of secretions like our COPD patient, <coughs> uh, that trapped air uh, is uh, eventually going to be absorbed by the, by the tissues, by the, 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 the uh, blood uh, uh, perfusing these alveoli. The oxygen is absorbed. Uh, now that's going to leave uh, a lot of nitrogen though that's going to keep that alveolus open. When the patient's on a high concentration of oxygen, those alveoli are filled with oxygen, not nitrogen. So that oxygen gets absorbed and what's left? Nothing. <laughs> so uh, you have that's called atelectasis. And especially with patients with a lot of secretions like our uh, COPD patients and patients who with any kind of chronic lung disease, uh, airways and alveoli are not functioning uh, properly and especially with a lot of secretions, you can develop atelectasis pretty quickly. And, um, <clears throat> and in fact, in the operating room, uh, the anesthesiologist is always going to ventilate his patient with 100% oxygen all during the surgery. And some of these surgeries last for hours and hours and hours. So the patient who went into surgery had, was breathing room air, did not need it, hadn't went, getting any supplemental oxygen. He's breathing room air. His O2 sats are high. Uh, after surgery, he comes out and he's on the ventilator on 100%. We start turning it down. We turn it down, turn it down, watch our pulse oximeter. But we get down to about 35% oxygen and his sats start to go down in the low 90s. Why is that? It's cause of absorption atelectasis. We call this post-op atelectasis. Uh, and it's caused by the, the patient uh, being flat on the table, being operated on, and, uh, and uh, breathing 100% oxygen. They've actually done studies and found that patients have better outcomes if they ventilate them on room air during surgery. But the anesthesiologists aren't going to do that because they don't want to go in the courtroom and explain why they didn't have why they had the patient on 100% uh, didn't have him on 100% oxygen. Anyway, it's just one of those complicated things. Uh, but we do have to be aware of absorption atelectasis. We may intubate our patient, put him on 100% oxygen, but it's important that we start getting that down sooner rather than later. We want the patient to have the uh, uh, a safe level of oxygen, which is considered about 50%, less than 50%. So 100% uh, oxygen, pulmonary oxygen toxicity may start to be seen after 24 hours. 80% uh, oxygen, 48 hours. 50% oxygen, no longer a week. So you see, it's not just the concentration of oxygen, but it's the duration of the oxygen. The tidal volume. <clears throat> now, we uh, are going to determine our the tidal volume for our patient based on the patient's ideal body weight, not his actual body weight. And what we know is people breathe about five to seven milliliters per kilogram of their ideal body weight. And so uh, we need to know how to calculate ideal body weight for our patient. And that's going to be based on height and gender.
when I went to RT school back uh, in the old days, all the textbooks, Egan, every textbook, everybody believed that when we put a patient on the ventilator, we give them 10 to 15 mLs per kilogram. That was what was recommended. That was the standard. That's what we did with all of our patients. We had great big tidal volumes. That's double the normal tidal volume. Now, so <clears throat> uh, we've learned now that that causes lung injury. So why were we doing that? Why were we doubling the tidal volume back then? Well, that all came from the anesthesia literature. Very Right after we uh, started intubating people and providing positive pressure ventilation, and uh, in the operating room, they found that they had less post-op atelectasis if they gave them a double a normal tidal volume. Also, CO2 was never a problem when they doubled their tidal volume. Uh, so that wound up in the literature without any kind of evidence, and um, it led to a lot of patients receiving a lot of harm over quite a few years. Uh, we'd given patients <coughs> tidal volume of 1,000 and 1,200. It was just pretty routine. <clears throat> Today, we don't <clears throat> we don't do that six, uh, ten to fifteen mLs per kilogram. <clears throat> We're going to give them six to eight. That's what's recommended. That's what we know is safe. Now, as I, as I said, a patient who has ARDS, two thirds to three or fourths of his lungs can be collapsed. So uh, our studies that have been done show us that <clears throat> these patients are going to have less lung injury, have better outcomes if we ventilate them with no more than about 6 mLs per kilogram in most cases. <clears throat> and we may even go to 5 mLs per kilogram or 4 mLs per kilogram for ARDS patients. So uh, depending on the type of patient, uh, you're going to use uh, sl maybe slightly different uh, tidal volumes. But today, we're going to use 6 to 8 mLs per kilogram uh, on all of our patients. Uh, we may have to make adjustments on that when we get a blood gas or when we see how much pressure it takes to put that tidal volume in. Uh, it could be a dangerously high pressure, so we come down from uh, 8 mLs per kilogram to 7 mLs per kilogram. Um, anyway, we have, to, we have to start somewhere, so we should start at 6 to 8. 6 for ARDS is what's recommended. So here's how we're going to calculate ideal body weight. Remember, it's based on height and gender. <clears throat> we know that a, a, a male patient who's five feet tall has an ideal body weight of 50 kilograms. <clears throat> a female patient who's five feet tall has an ideal body weight of 45 kilograms. Now, since all our patients are not five feet tall exactly, uh, we need to add if they're taller or subtract if they're shorter. So what we're going to do is we're going to add 2.3 kilograms for each additional inch over 5 feet tall. So a male patient 5 feet tall with an ideal body weight of 50 kilograms, we don't have to do any math. <clears throat> but he's 5 foot 1, then we need to add 2.3, right? We're going to add 2.3 kilograms to the 50 kilograms. So he gets 50 kilograms, 50 kilograms for being five feet tall, and he gets 2.3 for being because he's one inch over that. Uh, so his ideal body weight would be 52.3 kilograms. But what, what if the guy's five foot ten? Let's do do the math here. We got a male patient five foot ten. Well, he gets 50 kilograms for being five feet tall plus 10 inches. Uh, that would be uh, 10 times 2.3 would be 23 kilograms, right? 10 times 23 is 23 kilograms. So 50 kilograms plus 23 kilograms would be 73 kilograms. His ideal body weight is 73 kilograms. If we wanted 10 mLs per kilogram, uh, we wouldn't, but just to make the math easy, if, the, if we wanted to give this guy a tidal volume of uh, 10 mLs per kilogram, he would get a tidal volume of 730. Now, female patients have smaller lungs because they're smaller people, and <clears throat> so uh, a female patient who is five feet tall has an ideal body weight of 45 kilograms. Actually, it's 
but most people just use 45 because it just makes the math easier and it's not a whole lot of difference. Now, when you, you're going to find on your ventilator, uh, at, at, the, at least the, um, the Hamilton G5, and I think probably all ventilators that tell you ideal body weight, uh, they use 45.5. So you do your calculation using 45, and they do 45.5. You'll think maybe the ventilator is wrong or you did your math wrong. Um, it's just the difference between uh, using 45 or 45.5. Uh, most places, we just calculate that as 45 uh, mLs per kilogram. And then again, you're going to add 2.3 kilograms for every inch over 5 feet tall she is. So uh, this is what we're using in, in our hospitals everywhere. It's what our ventilators do tell us to add volume in the, uh, as, uh, as their ideal body weight. This formula is what you'll be using. Uh, there is a couple of other formulas to uh, calculate ideal body weight, but all of them are going to be close to, to one another. Uh, so this is a, a good one because you get your answer in kilograms. One of the other formulas, you're going to get your answer in pounds, then you have to convert that to kilograms. So it's just one less uh, math step that you have to take doing it this way. And the, all of the big research uh, that they do on patients on ventilators looking at tidal volumes, they use this um, formula right here for calculating ideal body weight. And so you'll see that as IBW, ideal body weight, uh, and literature, some places you'll, you'll see it called lean body weight or predicted body weight. It all means the same thing, ideal body weight. So we're going to give our patient a tidal volume that is based on their ideal body weight. So you just need to memorize this little formula right here. It's not hard. Uh, five feet tall is 50 and 45 and add 2.3 for every inch. Or if they're less than um, five feet tall, you take away 2.3 kilograms for every inch under they are. So the other uh, parameter we're going to have to select for our patient on, that we just intubated is the respiratory rate. And I already gave this away. It's 12 to 18 breaths per minute. That's where we're going to start. Now, we um, <clears throat> have to be aware of um, the problems that some patients have because of uh, obstructed airflow, like our COPD patients. They don't do well with fast respiratory rates. You have a patient with severe COPD, you give him 18 breaths per minute, that might be way too fast. Um, you got to give them time to exhale. And when you have somebody that takes longer than normal to exhale, uh, they need uh, to have a lower respiratory rate. Uh, you're going to set an inspiratory time and an expiratory time on your ventilator. And if most people with normal lungs and airways exhale their tidal volume in about two seconds. But a patient with COPD it may take him six or seven seconds to exhale. So if you, you can see what would happen if you set his rate at 18 breaths per minute. <clears throat> Think of this, to make the math easy, say 20 breaths per minute. If we have the ventilator set for 20 breaths per minute, that would be we'd set an inspiratory time usually around one second. So inspiration is one second. How much time do they have to exhale? Two seconds, right? Because at 20 breaths per minute, that's three seconds cycle time. That's three seconds between each breath. So if one second is spent on inspiration, that means they only have two seconds to exhale. A patient with COPD would be trapping a lot of air. Remember the term we talked about earlier? Dynamic hyperinflation? That's what happens. So that is a pretty serious problem. We don't want to uh, have all this air trapping uh, for our patients. So <clears throat> you want to use slower rates for patients who have ob obstructed airflow. And uh, for everybody else, though, about 12 to 18 breaths per minute is going to be fine. And here's a, a little graph that shows what happens with this air trapping, this dynamic hyperinflation problem. If we look over here on this axis, this is volume. So this is volume going in. And let's say, let's say this is a 500 tidal volume. So 500 goes into the patient. Then he exhales. He should exhale all the way back down to here, right? That would be 500. 
But what happened is the air went in, and before he finished exhaling, the ventilator gives him another breath. So 500 goes in on top of that. And then he exhales up. The ventilator gives him another breath before he finished exhaling again. And you see what happens after a few breaths. This guy's full of air. You know, this is his FRC, right? This, you know, the FRC, that's your functional residual capacity. This is the volume left in your lung after you exhale. You exhale normal exhalation. At the end of exhalation, your lungs don't collapse. There's still air in there. So, and this is uh, the FRC. And you see what's happening to FRC. If uh, we put this air in and don't let it all out, the FRC is up to here. Now the FRC is up to here. So now this guy is full of air. This is all trapped air. So do you think uh, that would exert a pressure? You're darn right. The, this pressure can get pretty high uh, in his thorax. So the, a couple of problems with this is, one, uh, he's full of air, and we have a machine that's just pushing another breath in, pushing another breath in. And so uh, uh, lung injury from over distension, pneumothorax, could be a problem. Another s serious problem that you're going to see uh, often is this patient becomes hypotensive. Why, did he, why does he become hypotensive? Well, <clears throat> it's because the, the, if you think about circulation, the pulmonary circulation, the blood comes uh, in from the vena cava, which the vena cava is in the pleural space, from the pleural space into the thorax, in, into uh, perfuse alveoli. Well, with this high pressure in the chest, this high intrathoracic pressure, that impedes the venous return to the right heart. So if there's less blood coming to the right heart, that's going to decrease cardiac output from the right side of the heart. And if the cardiac output decreases in the right side of the heart, it's going to decrease on the left side of the heart. And what happens to the patient's blood pressure? It goes down. So uh, uh, it's not unusual to intubate a COPD patient uh, or an asthma patient who has severe air trapping already and we put them on a machine and we make the air trapping even worse and they become hypotensive and we're giving them something for their blood pressure. So uh, remember the two problems uh, with uh, this air trapping is uh, hypotension and uh, lung injury from over distension as in uh, pneumothorax, pneumomediastinum, those kind of uh, issues. Okay, here's a little problem for you. Uh, you get called down to the emergency department, draw a blood gas on a COPD patient. He's getting two liters nasal cannula. And uh, you get the blood gas back, and his PO2 is 69, CO2 is 72, pH is 742. Now, this guy's doctor is real concerned about the high CO2, 72. That's pretty high. And he asks you if you think the patient should be intubated and mechanically ventilated. Now, what are you going to tell him? What are you going to tell this doctor who, who asked you that question? And why would you tell him that? <coughs> Time's up. Uh, you don't have enough information here to really tell if this guy needs to be intubated. He's in the ED. Why is he in the ED? We don't know. Uh, but just based on this blood gas and the fact that he has COPD, uh, you probably would not want to uh, recommend intubation. Uh, this guy doesn't have acute respiratory failure. His CO2 is 72, so that's a that's respiratory failure. It's supposed to be 40, right? But his pH is normal, which tells us that this is his normal CO2. So this is a, this is respiratory failure. It's hypercapnic respiratory failure, but it's not acute respiratory failure, it's chronic hypercapnic respiratory failure. Now, if the CO2 on this patient was 72 and the pH was 725, that would be what we would call acute on chronic respiratory failure. As chronic respiratory failure, a COPD patient, as CO2 is normally high, but this 72 is much higher than what it normally is, we know because if his pH is 725. So we're going to have more of these kind of questions uh, as we go along here. Um, the, the next section we're talking about is going to be modes of ventilation.
That's a very confusing part of mechanical ventilation. The ventilator manufacturers want you to think that they got something on their ventilator that the other ventilators don't have. So they say, we got this new mode. And really uh, what you'll find is that often they've just came up with a new acronym for the same old mode. Anyway, I'm going to try to straighten this out for you and get you started on uh, having a, a much better understanding of uh, something that's very complicated with mechanical ventilation, and that is modes of ventilation. So stay tuned for part two of Introduction to Mechanical Ventilation.